I'll, I'll, I thought I'd just uh, tell you a little bit about how I came to write the book, why I came to write the book, since it is a uh, departure from what I normally used to cover, um, and uh, tell you a little bit about what's happened since the book came out in hardback a year ago, and then just open it to questions, if that's okay with everybody. Um, I, I, I first became interested in the outpost, or aware of the outpost, combat outpost Keating, uh, one day after that guy was born. Jack was born on October 2nd, 2009, and Combat Outpost Keating uh, uh, was attacked on October 3rd, 2009. And so I'm just a news junkie, so I'm, I'm constantly paying attention to what's going on on, the, on, the, on CNN. I was at ABC News at the time, but at CNN uh, in, the, in the hospital room, um, just as, a, as an example of this, on the day my daughter was born, that was the day that Larry Craig's story broke. So I happen to know for the rest of... <laughs> my life that Larry Clegg, Craig's uh, toe-tapping incident became uh, known on October, I'm on August 27th, 2007, just because that's my daughter's birthday. This one, Jax was a little bit more serious. I was not inspired to write a book after, uh, after uh, Alice was born. But this one, something just stuck in my craw um, about this, this story, about this remote outpost. Uh, the media coverage accurately um, talked about how uh, it didn't really make sense for an outpost to be there at the bottom of three steep mountains just 14 miles from the Pakistan border, uh, and that the men there, the troops that fought there, um, felt like they were sitting ducks. It was the deadliest day for the U.S. in Afghanistan that year, 2009. Eight U.S. soldiers uh, were killed that day. And as a news consumer, uh, I was just interested in learning more. And I waited and never heard uh, the answers to my questions, which were, why would anybody put an outpost there? Who were these people? Who were these troops uh, who woke up that day and were faced? There was 53 U.S. troops there, and they were facing up to 400 Taliban surrounding them in the mountains. Who, who were these guys? Who were the eight men who were killed that day? And um, I waited, and no one told me. Um, part of that is the fact that uh, uh, the, I think the Pentagon doesn't share a lot of information, quite honestly. Uh, the Army investigation... Uh, was fairly narrowly focused on what happened wrong that day uh, instead of why was the outpost built there three years before. Um, and ultimately, I just, as somebody who had been covering the war in Afghanistan, as I, at, at the time I worked for ABC News and I was a senior White House correspondent, so I'd been covering the war in Afghanistan from the North Lawn of the White House, and, and quite frankly, I'll criticize my own coverage. I don't want to speak, for, or to speak about anybody else's, but frankly, my coverage was a little a glib. It was about uh, the, the troop level debate, 10,000 troops, 20,000 troops, 5,000 troops, numbers as if I was talking about you know, a Wall Street ticker or a baseball score, um, the politics, McChrystal versus Obama, the Pentagon versus the White House, those tensions. Um, but frankly, uh, it, it was all a little superficial, my coverage. And I, I, uh, I started making calls to troops who had served there just to find out more. Um, ultimately, I talked to a, num a number of them who had served in 2009, who were there during that horrific attack, and uh, got a contract with, the, with the Little Brown and Company. And then other troops started hearing that I was writing this book. Um, either, I mean, it didn't get a huge amount of notice, but it was picked up a little bit in print. Um, and, but also I was on Facebook and I was reaching out to people. And a guy named Ross Burkoff, who had been a captain in 2006 with the team that set up the camp at Combat Outpost Keating, he reached out to me and he wanted me to understand why the camp was put there uh, and what the decision making was and how things were different in 2006 than they were in 2009. And most importantly, uh, I feel like he wanted me to know who men such as Ben Keating, whom, uh, after whom the camp was named, who he was. And Joe Fenty, uh, a lieutenant colonel who was killed in the process of, of uh, establishing the camp, who's, who's, uh, whose death in a helicopter in 2006 um, with nine other men did not get a lot of attention. Um, so Ben told me all these, I mean, um, I'm sorry, uh, Ross told me all these really interesting stories, and I realized, okay, well, that's interesting. Maybe I can do, I can have a little bit about the beginning of the camp and then just focus it on this battle. But then another guy named uh, Lieutenant Dave Roller uh, reached out to me. He was with the, the team, the, the company that served there after that, 2007 until 2008. 
and uh, he wanted me to know about their year there and the men who had died and the men who had served uh, and survived there. Uh, and then I heard from others uh, who served with the next company, 6-4, uh, uh, that Kane Meshkin is with, uh, or was with, um, who had served there and had had their captain uh, killed, uh, assassinated. Um, and every company had its own amount of very touching and very moving stories um, not just about tragedy, but also about about brotherhood, about loss, about military strategy, um, and and pretty soon uh, I would I had been basically forced uh, by the soldiers to write a much more ambitious book than I had set out to to do, uh, and and I think the book is much better for it, um, although it's certainly a lot longer uh, as well. Um, I uh, the process of writing the book was was a very um, it was very uh, labor intensive, obviously. I went to Afghanistan twice. Uh, once um, I was just a pool reporter on a trip with President Obama. We were in and out, just you know, there for a few hours. And the next time I went in 2011, I was embedded um, with uh, a medevac unit, and then I was embedded with uh, an infantry company that was at the forward operating base closest to where Combat Outpost Keating had once been. That forward operating base is, is uh, now in the control of the Afghan army, but at the time it was uh, forward operating base Bostik um, and uh, had been where a lot of the book take, took place. I couldn't get to combat outpost Keating. Uh, obviously, the, the camp uh, doesn't exist anymore, and, and it was abandoned by the U.S. Uh, shortly after that horrific battle uh, in October 3rd, 2009. Um, but also, um, the U.S. had basically ceded uh, from much of that province, uh, other than some special operations raids. Writing the book was a very uh, profoundly moving experience for me. Um, I'm, I've primarily been a political reporter. Um, my career as a journalist started um, at Washington City Paper in 1998 or 99, somewhere in there. It's all a haze. And uh, then I went to Salon.com, and then I had a bunch of other jobs, ultimately ended up at ABC News. Uh, for nine years, and now I'm at CNN. Um, but before I undertook this, I would say, even though I had done a few weeks, I'd served in Iraq uh, as, a, as a war correspondent for ABC News in 2005, 2006. Um, uh, even though I'd done that, I, I would say that mostly I'd been covering politics. And I think that the, the, the book really showed me, writing the book really showed me um, a whole other world. People talk about the 1% when they talk about the 1% the that's the richest 1% versus the 99%. But there's this whole other 1%, 99%, and that's the 1% that serves or their family members serve, and they sacrifice uh, for these wars that our elected representatives uh, have voted for, both of them, and our presidents have signed off for uh, on, and, and President Obama doubled down on one of them and, and, uh, and ended another. Um, but 99% of us, and again, I'll just speak for myself, but 99% of us don't really know much about them other than what we read because we don't experience them. When you hear about, oh, this, their tours have been extended, which is what happened in 2007 to a bunch of troops um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're, they had one-year tours, and um, they were extended um, by three or four months. Um, to us, to me, that doesn't mean much. But uh, to the troops and to people who had been planning on seeing their loved ones and who were happy that they were just a couple days away from knowing that they had survived their time in Afghanistan or Iraq, or people who were planning on getting married a month after they got out of Iraq or Afghanistan, it obviously means uh, a, quite, quite a bit. Um, so it opened my eyes to um, a number of, of struggles and sacrifices that a lot of people make in this country. Uh, and then it also, I think, I hope, made me a better journalist, just in the sense that I, it made me, um, I think in this town there's a lot of very glib, we should send our troops in, we need to do something about that, why can't we just send troops in? And uh, you hear it from both sides, you hear it from neocons, and you hear it from uh, people on the left who are really interested in humanitarian intervention. And I think that um, it's made me much more skeptical of of, of what that entails. Uh, one of the lessons that I think we've learned from Combat Outpost Keating um, is that if you do send men and women into harm's way, uh, we need to make sure that they have everything they need 
to do their job, everything they need, and we can't short them on anything. Uh, and uh, in, there are, you know, there are, this book mainly takes place in Afghanistan, um, other than other than family members hearing about uh, loved ones who are injured or, or lost. But you do see, um, I tried to draw lines between decisions made by people in Washington, D.C., whether it's Rumsfeld or Gates or Bush or Obama, decisions they make and how they directly end up impacting people on the ground. Um, one, of the, the, one of the things that has been some um, uh, source of comfort for me in, in writing this book is, A, when I started writing it, a lot of people uh, felt, a lot of people who had served at Combat Outpost Keating uh, were, they seemed to me to be happy that anybody was taking the time to tell their story because nobody had told their story. Um, and then since uh, the book came out, uh, two of the troops who served uh, at Combat Outpost Keating during that horrific battle, two of them were awarded the Medal of Honor. Um, that's the first time that's happened since 1968 that two living service members were both awarded um, the Medal of Honor for, for actions the same day in the same battle. Um, the last time that happened was Vietnam. Two individuals were, were given the Medal of Honor for the Black Hawk Down incident, uh, coincidentally also on October 3rd, uh, but 1993, but both of those Medals of Honor were posthumous. Um, so Ty Carter and uh, Clint Romache, who were both served at Combat Outpost Keating in the 361, uh, were awarded the Medal of Honor. Um, so that was, that was um, I, I think that they 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 feel like people now know their story a little bit better, which is which is which is nice. Um, and uh, I guess I wanted to read just one one specific um, section. I usually read the Kane Meshkin section, but I'm not going to read it because he's here, and I don't want to embarrass him. Um, so uh, I'll just read um, this one section about um, the the very end of of the battle. You already know it has a bad ending, so this isn't a spoiler alert. Um, okay. So just to paint a picture of, of what has happened at Combat Outpost Keating, it was um, at dawn on October 3rd, um, 2009, up to 400 Taliban attacked this remote outpost. Um, there are only 53 US troops. Uh, it is an almost indefensible place, as, as President Obama and the military investigation would later, later say. Uh, it was surrounded by high, high ground. Um, eight men are killed in defending the base, but ultimately they do beat back the Taliban uh, because of some unbelievable courage by the men who served there and also because of air support, uh, which at first was not able to get in there uh, to, to do anything effective because the Taliban um, are very, very fierce and often very, very smart fighters. Um, this part of Afghanistan, in particular, Nuristan province, um, you may have read about if you've ever read um, The Man Who Would Be King by Rudyard Kipling. It is known as one of the fiercest parts of a country that is fairly fierce, the Afghanistan of Afghanistan. It is um, a, its own separate ethnic group, um, and it was the, they were the last ones to convert to Islam in the 19th century, uh, among the first to take up arms against uh, the Soviets. Uh, in 1979. Uh, they don't like outsiders much. Anyway, this happens at the very, very end of the battle. It was dark now. In addition to the rest of Sachs's group from 132 Infantry, Special Forces troops had also arrived and were clearing Camdesh village and reinforcing observation post Fritchie up in the mountains. Captain Stoney Portis went to the Red Platoon barracks, outside which he saw Lieutenant Bunderman's lanky silhouette. You've done an incredible job, Portis told him. I'm the commander again. You're Red One. As Bunderman was relieved of his command, he exhaled and rolled his shoulders. You've done an incredible job, Portis repeated. There weren't many places to sleep at Camp Keating that night. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you that the entire place burned down in the middle of the battle. Um, so there weren't that many places to sleep at Camp Keating that night, just the Red Platoon barracks and the aid station and the ground, and the ground around them. Few slept and none slept well. October in Afghanistan. It was chilly. Some of the troops were wearing only t-shirts and shorts, having been woken up suddenly that morning, and then later having lost all their clothing to the day's fires. Bodies, living ones, were scattered throughout the small section of the camp that was still standing. Red platoon troops crashed in their barracks while the bastards, that's the name of a different platoon, slept on the deck of their cafe, huddled together. They slept on body armor, which wasn't at all soft. They curled up in the fetal position, 
covered with this day's worth of sweat and smoke. Portis walked outside the Red Platoon barracks. The dying fires crackled in nearby buildings. A glow stick flickered a blue light. Then Bo Portis heard a sound. Someone was singing. I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when. Portis walked into the barracks. Chris Jones and his guitar had both survived the attack, and Jones was playing Johnny Cash's classic Folsom Prison Blues, sitting in the middle of the barracks and moaning in his Tennessee twang with Zach Coppus. When I was just a baby, my mama told me, son, I'm going to spare you my singing. Always be a good boy. Don't ever play with guns. But I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. When I hear that whistle blowing, I hang my head and cry. Portis shook his head at the moment. The white noise emanating from the radio was interrupted by a squawk. He thought about the soldiers who'd been killed, his men. Just one night before, they'd all gone to bed, thinking they would soon get out of this cursed valley surrounded by these ominous mountains. But the mountains had gotten them first. So um, anyway, writing this book was, I would have to say, the most um, significant and, and meaningful experience of my professional life. Uh, I've been a journalist for 15 years or so. Um, but getting to know these troops, staying in touch with them, seeing what they're going through still to this day. Uh, one of the guys in the book uh, just got out of a, a special brain center uh, to help deal with his PTSD and uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, there's a, there's a, a guy who served in, at Combat Outpost Keating who was there the day of the attack, who, um, who overdosed uh, less than a year after the camp, after the camp um, was attacked. Um, and uh, it was, it was uh, Ty Carter invited his parents. He'd, he'd, already, he'd already been discharged by the Army, kind of been forced out of the Army. Um, which is really not equipped to deal with uh, individuals uh, who have PTSD that, that well. Um, and uh, he'd been forced out, but um, Ty Carter, when he was awarded his Medal of Honor in August, made sure to invite the Faulkners, um, Ed Sr. And his, and his wife, uh, from, up from North Carolina. And uh, not only were they there, but President Obama mentioned their son as, as, a, as a fellow victim of Cop Keating, somebody whose PTSD Ty Carter has PTSD as well, um, uh, whose PTSD uh, he did not survive. Um, but it's 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 been very meaningful to to them to have President Obama mention their son uh, as somebody who who served there. And uh, I just I just feel like there's a there's a lot going on um, that we don't pay attention to, and we have we have a conservative estimates of our about five hundred thousand troops with PTSD or some form of depression from the war. Uh, walking around now and we owe it to them to pay attention to them at the very least listen to their stories so anyway that's my experience with the book and i'm really delighted to have ha answer any questions it's great to be here at politics and prose um, i want to thank everybody for being here my wife and i are here every week we live like just a few blocks away and probably um have bought an entire wing at this point uh especially in the children's section so uh I, but if you have any questions just raise your hand i'm happy to answer any questions so um I mean, one of the things that's interesting about this, about the outpost and the location of it, I think, is it, is it, it talks, it, it reveals a lot about what happens in war. When they set up the outpost in this, in this location, and by the way, yours is not an unreasonable question, even troops who served at Combat Outpost Keating, especially troops who served at Combat Outpost Keating, did not understand why they were in that place. But, but I found the people who made the decision, and here's the, here's the reasoning. One, this was a time in the war when the strategy was set up lots of different small places, small camps and outposts throughout this area, eastern Afghanistan, Nuristan, and Kunar province. And just so you know, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but it's something like of the nine medals of honor who have, that have been awarded for actions in Afghanistan, something like seven of the nine were awarded for actions in these two provinces. Um, so... It was an area that the U.S. got to maybe five years into the war. All of a sudden, we started paying attention to eastern Afghanistan, which is the border with Pakistan, which is near Tora Bora. It's where bin Laden had lived for some, you know, I don't know why, but we were finally expanding into that area. Keep in mind, this was the war that was undermanned, underfunded. Everybody in, at the Pentagon was, and the White House were focusing mainly on Iraq. So, so there, there they were, and they needed to set up these outposts. Um, the reason they wanted to set up at that particular location was, one, they were convinced that arms were coming in from, from Pakistan, and they wanted to stop that. And two, they wanted to bond with the local population so that they could then um, 
win them over, hearts and minds, uh, or what's called uh, coin or counterinsurgency. Win over the locals, and the locals will be do the fighting and do the work for you of kicking out the bad guys. Um, so that's why they were there. It was a part, it's near the Hindu Kush, it's on the Hindu Kush mountain range. So you're either on a mountain or you're at the bottom of a mountain. Um, there were people who thought they should have been on the mountain, uh, but the thinking was, well, then we can't bond with the local populace because they're at the bottom of the mountain. Um, everything changes just from 2006 to 2009. The enemy that they're fighting changes. The, the, the infiltration by the Pakistanis uh, increases. Um, the relationship with the locals changes. I mean, one of the things that I do in the book is you meet locals in 2006 who troops in 2007, 2008, 2009 deal with. But by the time the 2009 troops are there, um, you know, they've seen any number of American commanders. Two of them have been killed, uh, including uh, Kane's former commander, uh, Robert Yeskes. Uh, and um, they, they don't know who's going to be there the next week, but they know who's going to be there in 10 years, and it's the bad guys. So why were they there? Does that mean you're not going to buy the book now? <laughs> everybody, kn everybody knows that the book was there. Why the what? So this is a little bit broader question, okay. maybe. But uh, because of the volunteer uh, military that we have, what are the future implications? We don't have a shared cost in right. a larger society. So what does that? Um, what are the challenges of that volunteer army for future military engagements and, and lack of a shared cost? Well, I, I think you know I'm not a policymaker. I'm just a reporter. I, I think I personally don't think it's sustainable to keep having one percent do all the work and all the sacrifice um, with the 99 percent, and I'm, I'm in that 99 percent playing so little a role. I mean, it, I think it's sustainable for another few decades, but uh, just ultimately, I just don't know that morale-wise, especially if we keep entering these conflicts, it can continue. I'm not, I'm not calling for a draft, I'm not calling for a tax, but it just seems like it's not healthy. Um, one general, and he's quoted in the book, although not by name, but if I told you his name, you'd know it, uh, told me uh, for the purposes of the book, he was hoping that it would open people's eyes in the 99% because he compared it to, it's almost like legionnaires. It's almost like we hire fighters, foreign fighters, to do our fighting for us. Um, except it's not, ultimately, because it would be like that if the 500,000 legionnaires who we hired who now have PTSD and really need help then lived among us, which is which is what we're faced with right now, and that's I still think a very very conservative estimate. If 2.5 million Americans have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, I just think we owe them a lot more than they're getting. We're starting to see people talk about, you know, pe people in the business community start um, hiring veterans programs, and uh, hopefully uh, that can that can continue. I can tell you um, as. A member of the Vietnam demonstration, the Vietnam years, I graduated from college in 1969, that if there were a draft, these wars would be over tomorrow. Uh, once middle class kids started getting drafted for a war that it was apparent that we were losing, uh, the entire middle class came out into the streets. I mean, it's an interesting point. I don't know that that's necessarily the case with Afghanistan, because, because one of the things that um, I learned when meeting people who, keep in, first of all, keep in mind, a lot of the people who serve in the wars right now were five or six during on 9/11. So a lot of the, so a lot of the people, um, especially a lot of people in Kane's uh, company, um, enlisted uh, after 9/11. They wanted to do something. They wanted to fight. They wanted to help do something for this country that had been attacked. So I don't know that it applies precisely. Certainly, Iraq is a better uh, uh, correlation. What did the soldiers think? Did they did they talk to you about how they felt after the bat after they had served after the battle, and then I guess eventually we pulled out? Um, did they figure they had done their job and they didn't think about it anymore, or were they more reflective? Did they feel they had been, in some sense, betrayed? <laughs> Betrayed's a tough word. That's right. I mean, it's um, you know. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of troops, and they all have their different opinions and emotions about what happened, and and their own and their own different experiences. 
Um, I don't, first of all, just so you know, again, it doesn't spoil the book, but they were, they were in the process of closing the camp when it was attacked. Ah, okay. um, the guys who came in, the commander, Colonel Robert George, and the lieutenant colonel, uh, Brad Brown, came in. Actually, they visited the camp in December 2008 when they were preparing to take over the next May. And the day they visited happened to be uh, the day that, that Kane's commander, Rob Yeskis, they had a memorial service for him. He had been targeted by, he had basically been assassinated by a remote control IED. And they landed, Colonel George and Lieutenant Colonel Brown, and they looked up and they said, what the hell are they doing here? Um, and, and, and Randy George said, I don't know. They spent the next time, all, all the future months preparing to close down Cop Keating and other camps. And when they brought their plan to McChrystal, uh, McChrystal said no. Uh, and you can, I'll leave for you to read it, but why? There, well, McChrystal had his reasons, mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot of them were very political reasons having to do with his tensions with Obama, his desires to help uh, do whatever President Karzai wanted leading up to the August 2009 elections. Ultimately, uh, McChrystal says yes mm -hmm. when the timing is better and, the a and they have the, the assets to do so, but by then it's too late. Do they, feel they, all have they all have different feelings. Like, yeah, some of them feel betrayed. Some of them don't understand why they were there. Some of them, um, you know, I th I, it's also, you're not, your question doesn't include, but I should add them to it, um, the, the widows and moms and right. dads of right. the people who, who were lost there, the eight troops who were lost there. And I think that there is a resentment of what, what were they fighting for? Why were they there? Why wasn't there better planning? Why, were, why weren't our, why wasn't my son, why wasn't my husband, husband given what he needed to do his job? Why wasn't there better force protection? Those are, those are good questions and there are not a lot of good answers. Thank you. I want, I want to thank you for writing that book. Uh, it is an amazing book, and as you say, it's in terms of opening people's, people's eyes to what's going on there, and in particular, giving, uh, the, give, giving a view of what the troops are going through and what they encounter and the horrific kinds of things that they're exposed to. Um, so I, I think as I read the book or after thinking about it, I kept saying, here's another uh, uh, All's Quiet on the Western <laughs> Front. Uh, it's a book that I think everyone really should read. And, and it gives, it makes you understand, you know, when the president gets up and speaks and talks about soldiers and heroes, they're all heroes. You know, after you hear, you've heard that so much, it sort of slides over. Reading your book, you realize that there's merit to those kinds of words. So thank, thank you so you. much. It's nice of you to say. I really appreciate it. I mean, it, it, I, I agree with you. I mean, one of the things, one of the points, it's not only a depressing story. I mean, because you do realize how lucky we are that we have men and women who are willing to do this and the character of some of these people is so remarkable. All eight of the people killed that day at Combat Outpost Keating, all eight of them died in the act of doing something for someone else. Whether they were trying to save a colleague, whether they were delivering ammunition, whether they were just trying to return fire against the enemy, every one of them was, try was trying to do something selfless. One of the guys who died, he was the camp mechanic, but he died running to deliver ammunition uh, to uh, another, another soldier. So uh, it's true, I mean, and, and these are, th that's just one company. There, there are three other companies uh, more that I write about, and you see what they do for each other is, is, really, is really remarkable. Thank you, though. It's nice of you to say. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's nice. And that's the nicest compliment is when people who have served tell me uh, how much they appreciate it. Um, uh, I, I did talk a little bit about what inspired me to write the book, which was uh, the day after this guy was born in the hospital. Um, I looked up and I heard that that was the day of the attack and I heard about it and I just wanted to know more about the battle. Um, in terms of the, the, the uh, research process, which I didn't much talk about, um, it started with, I called, I, you know, I, I started Googling as much as I could about combat outpost Keating, and really there was not a lot at all written about it. Um, the New York Times at one point, based on some of the WikiLeaks, uh, did a story about like some of the messages sent that day when they were under attack. But there really was no, and I don't look, I don't fault the military. Military writers, we have some of the greatest military writers that there are, and they put themselves in harm's way. But it is a small group of people, and there is not that much interest uh, among the public, uh, sad to say. So the first thing I did is I found a story about some of the Latvian soldiers. There were two Latvian soldiers that day, Coalition of the Willing. Uh, and they were there, and, they, and one of the moms of one of the soldiers had had a reunion and had raised money and flown them to the, to the U.S. So with all these pictures of these huge Latvians at the Mall of America. So I reached out to her, uh, Mary Henry, and I told her I was interested in learning more. And she put me in touch with her son, who put me in touch with a first sergeant, John Hill, and... <laughs> It just went from there. A lot of soldiers are on Facebook, uh, so there was I was able to do a lot of research on Facebook or uh, just by finding people. You see who their friends are, and then you can reach out, oh, that's that lieutenant or that's this uh, sergeant I heard about. And then it just grows and grows and grows, and then and ultimately that's when other troops started reaching out and say, hey, you should cover our company, you should cover. One, there were two really very, very difficult decisions in this book. One was what to cut. There were troops who I spent hours with telling, you know, hearing about their story and ultimately it just wasn't that pivotal to the narrative. And, you know, my editor took out the scythe and uh, their stories. It's still, I mean, a very long book, but um, ultimately it would have been something that nobody would have been, nobody, it would have been this big and it, nobody would have purchased it. So that was difficult. The other very difficult decision was how graphic to be in describing wounds uh, and uh, how the methods that, that people are killed. That was a very difficult decision, and I went back and forth with soldiers, with um, some journalist friends, uh, and ultimately, uh, without making it gratu gratuitous, I tried to suggest uh, and write about what it actually means to be hit by an RPG. Uh, um, and And at the advice of one of the... Uh, the head sniper uh, for the 371, I put a warning at the front of the book saying that family members probably shouldn't read the book because it describes things that, that their loved ones went through. I did take some stuff out, but ultimately I felt like I'd never read what an RPG does to a body. I knew it was a rocket-propelled grenade, but I didn't know it comes in, there's a shock wave that first hits the body, and then the shrapnel hits the body. I didn't know that. And I'm, you know, I read the papers. I thought that was kind of stunning that I'd been covering the war and I'd never read that anywhere. I got it from a medical journal. Anyway. Yes, sir. Hey, John. Will there be a movie? Uh, I think it lends itself to a good movie, but uh, I don't know yet. There's a screenwriter who's expressed interest, but, um, you know, until Black Hawk, uh, I'm sorry, until uh, Zero Dark Thirty came out, nobody had made a, a movie about Iraq or Afghanistan that had that had done well, uh, and there had been some good ones into the Valley of Ella and and others um, movies that I thought were really really good. Um, I guess we'll see how Lone Survivor does. That's the Mark Wahlberg movie about um, the incident in Kunar Valley. Um, so I don't know, I don't know. Uh, some of the proceeds uh, of the book went to military charities that the troops picked out themselves. So if there is some more money for the military charities and he gets to go to college. <laughs> Not her though. Just joking. <laughs> it's just a joke. <laughs> other way around. Uh, uh, are there any other questions? Grandpa, did you have a question or you just, you just felt bad because nobody was asking when it went by? I'm Jake's answered or brought back in 
get to my attention, why are men and women so frightened? Yeah. It's really a tough question. What happened to you while you learned why are men and women so frightened? And it's, uh, the answers are all over the map. Is the truth. I mean, some some of them come from long lineages of of uh, of fighting. They can tra you know they can trace it back to the Revolutionary War. Uh, some of them are called to service. Uh, some of them saw some you know read a cool book about Operation Anaconda and thought that sounded cool. Some of them are directionless. Uh, some of them lived in New York City on 9/11. Uh, some of them are total screw ups. And it's either they know that it's either they enlist in the military and get their life back in, to, in order, or they'll probably end up dead or in jail. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of them. And a lot of their stories are f from running the gamut uh, are, are all over there. Um, one thing, because somebody asked me about you, I think you asked me about that's my time in Afghanistan. So the, the, there were two things we did, and I, I went with a producer from ABC News, I was at ABC at the time, and we went, uh, and we did, we went to shoot a bunch of stuff for Nightline, um, and uh, it, it uh, the, the we, we embedded with um, the Wolfhounds, and there's a second, there's a part of the book where I talk about my experience there. We embedded with this one infantry unit at a forward operating base near where Camp Keating was, and um, you know it's just it's terrifying. First of all, it's absolutely gorgeous. It is one of the most beautiful places I have ever been. The mountains of Afghanistan. It's just stunning. Um, but you're surrounded, you're surrounded by mountains and the and you can see somebody will say, look, that mountain over there, that's Pakistan. And uh, and the bad guys are there, or some of them are around you, and you know, you, you're walking around the camp and somebody says, Yeah, somebody just fired a fired a gun, a special gun, and and you can see here's where it hit in the wall. Um, yesterday. Thankfully nobody was there. And um, it's scary, you know. And uh, um, then we were embedded with a, a medevac unit. Well, anyway, I, we went with them just for the infantry unit. We went with them on some missions to like local villages and stuff. But it, it's terrifying. Um, and uh, she was not happy. My wife was not happy about me going. Um, and then the next thing we did is we went back to um, Bagram. And airbase, and we were and we were embedded with a medevac unit, uh, which was it's all it's a whole other different kind of terrifying. Uh, and one night we were out there, and we were fired upon, uh, and it, luckily it didn't come close, and we were fine. But then and then we're on these missions, and then we go, we pick up a wounded Afghan border patrol guard, and then we take him, we flew him to a different camp. By the way, it's awful to fly a helicopter. It's just so unpleasant. It's unpleasant doing it on Marine One with President Obama um, because it's, it's full, it smells like gasoline and it's loud and it's, it, you get motion sickness. But that's the nice, that's Marine One, right? I mean, then you do the one what the Army does and it's, that's really not pleasant. Anyway, so then we land in an Afghan camp and we're waiting for, we have a wounded Afghan Border Patrol guard there and we're waiting for the Afghans to get their act together and drive their ambulance you know, a quarter mile on their own base and pick up one of their own wounded soldiers. It takes about half an hour. We're terrified because at the previous camp we'd been fired upon, and um, and we're just sitting there. And, and this is this is one of the concerns I have about um, when we ultimately pull out is is not so much Afghan soldiers and what they're willing to do, but the infrastructure that it takes to support soldiers is so important and so wanting. Um, anyway, and then we. Flew back, and uh, just as a lighter story, I decided I would not tell my wife that we had been fired upon until I got uh, until I left Afghanistan. Um, but I, when I got back to to, Bag to Bagram, I emailed uh, my bosses at ABC News just to let them know. Um, I just thought that was probably the responsible thing to do. Hey, we're fine. Just FYI, we got fired upon. One of them motivated completely the, out of the right thing. Uh, but uh, probably shouldn't have done this. Calls my wife <laughs> to, you know, express condolences uh, that it's so it's rough. The Jake's there, and I hope you're doing okay. About, I guess, what, like ten seconds into the conversation, realizes Jen has no idea that I, you know, that this had happened. Uh, kind of quickly gets off the phone. I talk to Jen, and she's like, "Yeah, your boss just called me." Anyway, he and I have never spoken <laughs> about it, but it was funny when I got to the airport. Is finally because. 
I felt like I couldn't wait that much longer when I got to the airport and was sitting in the airport uh, uh, lounge. I called her and said, so this is why, but I'm about to leave. We're okay. But that was, I mean, that's nothing. I wasn't doing anything dangerous. I was just tagging along. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Before, I'll sign books here, but I do want to say, um, as I said at the, at the beginning, uh, Kane Meshkin and his, I think his wife and daughter are here. And these are the real heroes. Uh, oh, two daughters. These are the real heroes. Um, there's, there's a whole chapter uh, called What Was Wrong with Kane Meshkin, and it was about him dealing with his grief over the loss of his captain. And the answer, of course, to the question, which I don't think Kane first understood, is nothing is wrong with Kane Meshkin. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I want to thank him, especially as a surrogate for all the troops who serve. Thank you.